This is Star of the Storefront. On some level, we're probably all familiar with life-changing events. You never know when or where they'll take place, nor can you predict how you'll emerge from the ordeal. But we can all look back at our lives and pick out at least one point where our trajectories were forever altered. For Jennifer Stoykovic, one such moment came when a close friend was murdered. As she wrestled with the suffering that comes in the wake of such a tragedy, she set out to erase what suffering she could in this world. She became vegan. But to truly make an impact, changing her own dietary regimen wouldn't cut it. She needed to create something far bigger than herself. And thus, the Vegan Women's Summit was born. But you know by now that there's always more to the story, so listen in as we cover everything from how lab-grown meat is changing what it means to be vegan, why women generally don't invest, and why vegans don't all fit into the same box. Now, on to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Jenny, the founder of Vegan Women's Summit and an author of a new book. What's your new book? The Future of Food is Female. Love it. The conference is coming up. Tell us every, like, what, what made you want to start a conference? Let's start with that. So I never in my life planned to start a conference, I've got to be honest. I really just wanted to create a space where women could come together to talk about the future of food. So when we launched in 2020, nobody was doing that. Even, honestly, the future of food was not a mainstream conversation. It's changed a lot since the pandemic. And so the goal of Vegan Women's Summit was really how can we create a conference for professionals to come together and intersect and, and catalyze in a way that we are leapfrogging the industry in a way that women are in a position of leadership. Uh, I built my career in tech in a place where I was predominantly surrounded by male leadership. And so I want to turn the curve and make sure that women are leading um, for this new industry. And that was in San Francisco, right? That's where you... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Our very first one was 250 women in a room okay. in San Francisco. We are now 40,000 plus women professionals across six continents. Wow. So it grew fast in, in two years. Yeah. yeah. That's unbelievable. So when it comes to doing a conference, you also have some big names coming. Yeah, we in do. In a couple of weeks. Yeah, we have Alicia got, Silverstone. Yep, Alicia's coming. Um, we have, of course, you know, the top CEOs in the space like Miyoko Shinner, actress Emily Deschanel. We've got some Olympians coming. We really kind of do a cross-sector approach to women that are leading um, in their industries. And we want to show women that no matter what you do, you can contribute to bringing compassion to your career. What made you want to do this? What was the thing that was like, this is so personal to me? Um, maybe it's the food journey. Maybe it's the founder journey. Maybe it's the hybrid. It's both. So I went vegan myself seven years ago. I went vegan after a personal episode, actually a tragedy that happened to me, and it completely shook my entire view of the world. And um, it was a murder of one of my very close friends. And when going through such like a life-changing event, I just took inventory of everything I was doing on the planet. And so it became a natural kind of next step for me to figure out how I could be more impactful, how I could be more thoughtful, how I could bring compassion to my life. And so oh. in that healing journey, I decided to go vegan. It's a very atypical story. You usually yeah. hear, you know, That's my powerful. doctor said like my cholesterol was crazy. So I quit meat or, you know, you hear a lot of different origin stories for why people decide to adopt a plant-based diet. Mine was very much for um, healing of my spirit. It, and I decided a few years ago I was going to bring it to my professional life. Was your friend active in this space or, or were you doing this as a, a, for their memory? Like, because, for example, my friend in 2010 was killed on a motorcycle and I was not a motorcycle rider or aficionado by any means necessary, but I wanted to do something in his memory, in his name. So I started a safety foundation for motorcycle safety. Never having been a part of that community before, was was your journey at all like that? Like your friend active in the vegan space, or or is this just something that that you just discovered on your on your own? So first off, that's awesome. Kudos to you for taking a very difficult situation and making something you know impactful out of it. For me, it was a little bit more personal than that. So. A murder is a very difficult thing to deal with. I, I speak about it openly because I don't think people do speak about going through these episodes enough um, in public because it's just, it's a jarring thing. And I decided that if I was, you know, going to truly learn something from this that I would have to to heal and part of that healing means forgiveness so um, my husband and I actually forgave the murder like you know went to the prison and, and forgave him and we're still to this day the only people um, that were part of the trial that did everybody else did not and they've chosen not to and so part of that 
piece of compassion meant, you know, if I can forgive a murderer for murdering my best friend, uh, how can I bring compassion to other aspects of my daily life? The logical next step is, you know, what do you do three times a day? Was it more of a philosophical view that like, were you on your own little journey? For example, there's a lot of people that have near death experiences or in this case deal with death and what they come to realize is, and I think this leads them to the road of forgiveness, but what they come to realize is nobody is, is coming from a place of wanting to hurt. They're coming from a place of they're hurting and they don't know how to deal with that. And it's this like, right, very awful reality that atrocious things can happen, but it's, it's more of like, they're trying to solve some problem. Yeah. And this is something we're dealing with collectively. We're living in a very traumatizing totally. past like couple years. And even, you know, past few weeks, an entirely different type of trauma. If you don't deal with that and what it does to your spirit very often, you know, you'll sink or swim. For me, we were newlyweds. My husband and I, when this happened, it was the best man at our wedding. And it was like, you know, it could have split our marriage into two or it forges you together for life, right? And that's a very real thing, trauma bonding. So for me, it was just, it was a philosophical thing. It was, you know, if I'm going to heal my spirit and I'm going to put it back together, I'd like to put it back together better than how it was before. I was very young, very selfish, very, you know, I was in my early 20s. I was what the rest of us were then. You know, you're only thinking about yourself. You're thinking about like your career. You're going out every Friday and Saturday night. Like everything is just like a party. And in many ways, it just felt like the record screeching stop. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh my gosh, now I got to take inventory of who I am. And life's so fragile. Yeah. You forgive the person. That's unbelievable. We had Arno on the podcast. He was part of, he like started hate groups and then he led himself on a journey of one asking for forgiveness from a lot of the groups that he decided to oppress yeah. and do really awful stuff to and then two i still think he struggles with actually forgiving himself he but, does but yeah. his whole life journey his whole mission today is to spread why hate existed why he let it take hold of him and then in his words he wages peace because peace is not something that you can just sit back and idly do you have to actively be engaged in in creating peace in the universe so that's something that he does just to kind of keep the demons at bay like he's he's pursuing something noble and that's that's enough for him yeah absolutely so then okay so then it comes to like your life starts changing you realize the fragility of everything and then food was it a function of just like and i know this is kind of just moving off but is it is it just a function of ingestion of everything or was it food like was it like what am i watching on tv what am i consuming what am i reading and then ultimately like what food am i putting in my body what energy sources are going to give me you know where i want it like lead me to a place i want to go when does this start happening for you post psychedelics probably <laughs> uh but you know so i started i i did end up on that journey but that was not the start of the journey i didn't take that approach of like what am i putting into my body it was more about Actually, it was very external. It was, I felt very acutely aware of suffering and I, it started to turn up that ability to feel suffering more. And then I thought about, oh my gosh, like I, you know, factory farming is by far and large the, the biggest um, form of suffering that is going on in the world. So that was why I changed it. I was not healthy. I was not doing any of those practices, but as I ventured into this journey, I did start to pick up a lot of those practices. So, you know, to this day, like I don't drink alcohol. I eat a plant-based diet every day. You know, I don't, there's a lot of vice. I don't have a TV in my house. Like there's a lot of vices that I did end up over the years removing because they just seem like a distraction. I'm very much one of those people that likes to bring things into my life that amplify reality, not depress and numb it. Do you share this story a lot? Sometimes. I, I actually usually ask before the podcaster, you know, they say, oh, we want to talk about your journey. And I say, do you want the short one or you want the long <laughs> one? Because the long one can be heavy, yeah. but it's yeah. very impactful. Uh, but not every audience is prepared to hear something like that. Right. I feel I like you important. can tell a lot about the, the podcast itself, whether they want the short version or the long version. Yeah. yeah. We're more of long version people. I lost we my are, father when I was are. young. And so for me, like I think that was the moment I understood. He was assassinated. And I think as a kid, you grew up, you grew up with like this anger. Yeah. And then... I can't remember when this happened, but for me, it's just like, it became like I didn't fault the human anymore. Just like computers have software and today, you know, those are just Apple and Microsoft and you have two choices. Some humans are actually quite the same, right? Where it's like you wake up, everything you've ingested from TV or media or social media has a way of making you fit into a box. And yep. so what I mean by that is like, if you're a VC, I know exactly the furniture in your home. 
and it's like so like it's so obvious i know what magazine you look at and just like facebook can do that to you the media and television has a way of doing that to you too and it just people in boxes and so for me it was like okay if we just take that and throw an extreme on it right then we're all really just kind of doing the best we can but at the end of the day we're being programmed or not and so in developing countries this is a pretty i was born in peru and so it's pretty normal that you can buy votes with giving people rice you can convince them of anything you know you, you tell someone you can give them ten dollars a day that's enough for you to do some crazy things and so in that there's a as long as there's a logic even if it doesn't make any sense right as long as someone has oh i put these dots together and it led me to do this atrocious thing a part of me doesn't fault them but it was, it was a weird thing to, to get I to get that it. point. Yeah. I totally, 100% know what you're saying. Yeah. And it's very hard to explain to people that haven't been through this. Oh, yeah. That was part of the forgiveness of the murderer for us. Our best friend was from Ecuador. Um, and uh, his friend that, it was actually his friend that killed him, was from Colombia. And he just grew up, you know, it's macho, bravado, that kind of like BS over there. He grew up in an environment that was designed to make him that angry man that wants to argue and just like show off like machismo, whatever, you know, you want to call it. It's all programming. And, you know, when you realize that that was what he was acting from, he was acting from the toolbox that he had. Like those were the tools that were in his kit. Unfortunately, it was in a state where a lot of people carry guns. Um, and when you combine like that type of personality, you combined access to weapons, these things happen. And they're, they happen all the time. And they happen in developing parts of the world too, quite a bit. And this was very unfortunate because his parents, they both of them, they're immigrants, and they both, um, their parents gave up everything to bring them to America for a safer life. And, you know, the, the sad irony of, of it coming true here was just, it was horrible. But you can only really forgive it's useless to dwell. It's useless to try to exact revenge because it's not real. I also try to look at it like the other way. Like I just try to go, okay, cool. Something happened to me. It's up to me how I view that every morning now. Right. And yeah. so for me, it's like, we talk about this all the time, like the time, my time on this planet is short. And what that means is I have zero patience if you're not willing to be your best today. And that means there's a, like being my wife isn't always that fun. Right. Because I have that. I know I, like all of this meaningless stuff that we talk about could be over tomorrow. And so because of that, I want to make today the best shit ever. And it's like, who's on board? And then that's, imagine that all the time. It's kind of a lot, yeah. kind of a lot. But at the same time, it's like, that's, I think these are the things that happen. And so we try to like, even with the podcast, we're just trying to inspire entrepreneurship through truth so that everyone listening can just go out and everyone at your conference can like be a CEO, create change, yeah, put absolutely. your little dent in the world, right? It's like, just do the thing that's going to motivate you to wake up every day and crush and just do that. And just do something. Just do something. There's so many people that don't get off the starting line. Yeah. So, so many people, right? And like, yeah. what is it that we can do to make that difference, to show people, we can sit here forever and talk and talk and talk and talk. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how we're going to save the planet. Let's talk about, you know, how we're going to make a better food system. Let's talk about social impact, all of that. And it's just talk. It's cheap. And there's so, so few people that actually do something about it. And they don't always do it correct. A lot of people are learning out loud. That's what's happening in the food space. A lot of people are critical of, you know, founders doing this and that. And we're seeing it in the tech space. We're seeing what happens when it manifests, you know, when people, they tried to make products, they didn't think them through. And, you know, now we're dealing with the circumstances of it. And it's a difficult conversation to have, but I think if we're thoughtful in inspiring people and we're showing people that there is a path for them, I tell women all the time that there's still your place amongst the giants. It's a nascent brand new industry. Like it's, it's still evolving every day. You can be one of those big names. You can be in the history books. When you look at the industry, what are like the segments you put things in, right? And so we have maybe like farming or getting rid of the factory farming. Mm -hmm. And so we have that, like, how do you view it when you break it down into the different verticals that are changing? So it depends on, okay, so it depends on your, your viewpoint of, are you talking about like the different product categories? Or are you talking about the impacts? Because let's go with the impact. Okay. Yeah. So certainly animal agriculture and removing animal agriculture is a huge, it's the, the silver bullet if we're going to stop climate change, just because of the, you know, massive amounts of greenhouse gases that are generated from animal egg. So the, the different lenses in which people usually take a look at it are the reduction of, of suffering and, and things like that. There's also a lot of folks that look at the sustainability and environmental lens, um, a lot of like climate ESG investing that are now going into the space, a lot of health investing, um, a lot of people that are more interested in personal health and wellness. And then the last piece is kind of like the human rights and exploitation piece as well. There's a tremendous amount of, of breaks that are in the system right now that, as we know from COVID, we saw some of those stories come out. 
with like Tyson and places like that. Like the system is really broken and fucked up for humans too. The term vegan comes with a lot of uh, connotations with, with like you said, the animal rights, the, the ending of the suffering and the whole ecosystem. Whereas I've seen a new term evolve in the past you know, five years, which is like a plant-based. Uh, they don't even acknowledge the word vegan. Is, is there a, a rift forming between the two that you see? So that is a big question and one that I talk about a lot. So it really depends when, okay, first off, vegan as a term does not necessarily mean the same thing as plant-based in the new paradigm of the future of food. What I mean by that is vegan means a product that didn't exploit or, or kill an animal, okay? Plant-based products up until now were the only solution for that. We now live in a new world of technology where there are products that meet the criteria of never slaughtering or exploiting an animal, but are animal products, right? So then we get into things like precision fermentation. So for folks that aren't familiar, Brave Robot, you've probably seen at your stores. So that's a new technology that's been created and is now to market. It's, it's real. It's happening right now. And that creates an animal protein without an animal ever being involved. Um, Cell-based meat, you know, or lab-grown meat as mm -hmm. well. There's a lot of debate, like, is that vegan? Outside of bucketing it, is it, I would imagine it's directionally correct on the sustainability, right? It checks the sustainability box. Yep. And so are you pro or is it something like where you're just like, no, this is directionally correct, so I'm a fan? I am absolutely wholeheartedly going forward with cell-based future, whether it's cell-based meats, cell-based breast milk is an area that I am deeply passionate about. Cell-based breast milk represents a tremendous opportunity to just completely turn the curve for the future of infant nutrition and women's empowerment. Some of the solutions that we're now seeing through this quote unquote, you know, lab grown space are not possible in a plant-based space. So we need, to, we need to think about when we say the word vegan, what are we trying to accomplish? You know, it's like reading the constitution from like a few hundred years ago. Like you're reading, like what you're interpreting the spirit sure. of it. Vegan's a very old <laughs> word. It's the same, you know, it's the it's same thing. It's a really thing. good metaphor. Right? You yeah. know, we have to think about what is the spirit of it, right? Mm -hmm. When it was created nearly a hundred years ago, might I add, it was a term where if you ate an animal, then you had to have heard it. That is not the oh, case interesting. anymore. So that's changed fundamentally. Yeah. Of course it's changed, right? Yeah. Cell-based meat. It doesn't, it, you can eat meat and it yeah. never involved an animal. Right. And I think like that's a very important conversation that we need to have because we are just hurting ourselves. The more that we kind of splinter and like dig our heels in, you have a lot of like natural foods type folks that they're, they're not down. They're anti. They're, they're anti. Yeah. So there's like a war going on within... The there space. is. Yeah. That's so fascinating. So Natural Products, Ex um, so Expo West, right? Yeah. Tomorrow. Happening now. Yep. They have decided to approve precision fermentation products. So Brave Robot. There was a big, big backlash to that as to whether that can qualify as a natural product. What was the final consensus on that? Or this is, is almost it like the, the abortion issue. Yeah. This is turning into this the is, abortion issue. It's, it's incredible yeah. how polarizing it yeah. is. Even within the, the branch that is like, you know, you would think that everyone. That's such a bummer. Yes and no. <laughs> I, it's, it's an. It's normal though, because we are changing a, we're changing what was a binary before, right? You eat meat, you killed something. As we grew as a population, we kept eating more and more meat. So we had to kill more and more things. Now the environment is suffering as a result. So like there was logical connection. We now see how those actions have led to where we are today. But what if you could keep doing that thing that you like doing and it doesn't result in those, you know, catastrophic climate effects. So for me, when vegans go, well, that's not vegan. I'm like, well, well, shit, you're like the 1% that's not eating meat. We don't care about you. We care about the other 99% of folks, right? Oh, interesting. So that's what cell-based meat is for. It's not for vegans. It's for folks that want to continue eating meat, but they know that there's bad things that are happening with the meat. And most people agree that they don't want to contribute to climate change. They don't want to contribute to suffering, yet they'll still continue to be consumers of said products. Right. It seems like the, the way to go forward is to just have people reduce, at the very least, reduce their meat consumption, not only for the planet, but for their own health as well. Cardiac disease is one of the biggest problems in this country, and that can be cut in half by just reducing your meat consumption in half. You're right. That's the market that, that everyone should be trying to corral, is, is that market who aren't the 1% who are, are not eating or touching any meat products. It's the ones who are consuming most of the meat products. Do you pick sides at your conference? Like, do you, do you tackle this issue head on? Do you say, you know, this is evolving. This is evolving to a point where it's moving in this direction and we all need to get on board or what, how do you address it? 
right now, I think probably the only platform of its kind that focuses on threading together the plant-based and biotechnology space. So there's, you know, think tanks like GFI, our Good Food Institute for folks that aren't familiar, and we work a lot with them. But in general, nobody is really kind of threading the two industries. And and I have full-heartedly, I'm throwing everything I've got at animal-free innovation. So I don't care how you're doing it, unnecessary for us to have that debate. I also think it's unnecessary for us to start, you know, attacking certain plant-based products because, oh, they're not necessarily healthier for you. Well, there's multiple bastions in which that can stand, right? You can be way better for the climate. You can be better for living creatures. You can be better for health. Like, why is two out of three not good enough? It's good enough for every other industry. We have low-carbon beef is now coming out. That's a new marketing term that that mm. um, came out a few months ago. <laughs> so if we're eating low-carbon beef, why the heck? How do they achieve Achieve that <laughs> they plant trees so oh. they no i mean that is Offset. that is actually part of it Got it's it. like a new marketing <laughs> ploy it's it's like unbelievable right it's a new marketing ploy to you know convince folks that they're making a positive impact on the environment and you by can choosing- measure it Yeah, Yeah. of course. And it's the same as 10 years ago when everyone got really into free range beef and they thought free range beef was, you know, better for the environment. It was like 80% of people said they're interested in free range beef in studies, but it was less than 1% of all beef sales. So Mm -hmm. they did not translate. Especially not if they're deforesting to get that free range. If you were to create a product today, what boxes would it check and what kind of product would you make? So I'm really interested in women's wellness. And you can invent particular. anything, by the way. Anything, oh, anything. anything. So like you could even go, I've seen this little piece of technology and I think this is going to be here in three years and this is the thing. So I think that we can use cell-based innovation in many ways beyond just meat. Now we're seeing it with like coffee and we're yeah. seeing it with like other environmental products. So I honestly think cell-based breast milk, which is in kind of its early stages. So it is being created right now. But honestly, like if you can have cell-based breast milk, you can have cell-based human milk in many other ways too. Um, So there is a couple companies that are starting to tackle this, but imagine this, like riddle me this guys, all right? We can theoretically consume human milk throughout our entire lifespan. We have no idea what it will do to the human population, but we, when they've done small studies, they've shown that there's immense like health contributing benefits, much like how we're now keeping the umbilical cord blood and things like that, like the placenta, all of that. We see that there's all this health and you know, bodybuilders have the black market breast milk thing going, right? We can theoretically now remove all the dairy crap that we've been eating or drinking that is cow's milk and replace it with human version that's mammalian specific and it's bioidentical to, to what we would be consuming as mammals. So the argument for milk, though, is that beyond a certain point in our lives, we don't need it anymore, right? Like, like there's a reason why we wean off of breastfeeding at a certain age is because we don't need the, the, the nutrients from it anymore. Are we trying to meet people where they are and, like, instead of, like, just saying, like, hey, cut it out entirely, we're trying to offer them an alternative? Is that the, the idea behind this? So this is more in the health promoting category because we're just scratching the surface of what can happen if you do consume milk after infancy. So, yes, mammals... That's just that's a hallmark of what it means to be a mammal is you you ha- you wean off of your mom and you know you go into eating solid foods. But for folks with like IBS and there's certain conditions they're starting to do research on, which they're actually seeing that human milk, aka breast milk as it's known right now, can actually help with with healing benefits in the same way that the umbilical cord blood, we now are using that later in life in stem cells, but those, you know, if we hadn't used science to intervene, would not be available to us, but they're a benefit to us. So it's the same kind of logic. It's so fascinating. We just had the founder of Brainiac, the Brainiac Foods on. And so for him, he's like adding uh, omega-3s from algae mm-hmm. into like a yogurt. And so the, his whole argument is a lot of kids, one, very few get the breast milk they need. And oh, so that's like one not, issue. Yeah. Right. And then the second issue bad. is, and then it stops. And so by the time they're like six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, there's nothing like feeding the brain. And they very rarely are getting that from the food because they're not eating the right foods. And so his whole thing is he's giving them the vitamins that they need in a really interesting way. And it's all blended and it's algae, you know, omega threes and blah, blah, blah. But in this scenario, this solves the whole problem. It does. Yeah. And I take algae oil supplements every day too myself. It's interesting because. You're onto something. Well, here's the thing, right? The World Health Organization says you're supposed to breastfeed for three years. Okay. Three years? That's yes. way longer than I would have guessed. Yes. Was I breastfed for three years? I you were not. There's, uh, no, there's, there's no way, right? There's no way, right? Very yeah. few. I mean, perhaps, um, it, well, in developing parts of the world, uh, especially like in places like Africa, they certainly do um, because 
it's expensive to buy formula, right? But in, in the West, nobody, like you barely get people that make it to six months. It's less than one quarter, I think, of black babies that make it to six months even of breastfeeding, right? And so there's just such key nutrition that is missed in these like early, this you know, so the cognitive development. I, I worked early on in charity at United Way, um, so studied um, early childhood education quite extensively. And 85% of your cognitive development is done before the age of five. So if we, we... see it with Nick. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wasn't breastfed. I should, I should have been because my mom went back to work. Right. Right. And if you're, if you're in the United States and you're not like an affluent, usually white woman tech professional, you probably don't have mat leave. And so that's part of, that's also contributing to, you know, you get into the entire thing, like black babies, brown babies are way less likely to get the breast milk they need and then blah, blah, blah. And, and you can see how this can affect people their entire lives. So that's why breast milk in particular is such a huge kind of like linchpin piece to look at what we could do for future generations. We could get them on the right foot to begin with. And we can empower their mothers too, because there's a significant, there's a significant issue with like breastfeeding for moms that are, you know, three years. Like if you are trying to be a CEO, an entrepreneur, you can't have a kid latched on for three years. That's just not going to work. And and just in my friend group, there was one mother that lasted nine months and the other ones did not. And all the other moms were just giving her kudos. They were like, I got, it hurt. Mm -hmm. It's not fun. I have to go. I have a job. I want to get back into the office. And so I think this solves a multitude. What do you call it? What do you call the company? Give a name for it. So there is, there's a couple companies that are focusing on this right now. So, so Biomilk's one that is focusing on it. Um, and then there's Turtle Tree Labs. They're focusing on human milk. There's over 2,000 ingredients in milk. So they're focusing on, I think, lactoferrin and a couple of those um, specific ingredients right now. But I think that that's just scratching the surface of what we can do with the capabilities of human milk and, and what those ingredients can, where they can go in your yogurts, you know, yeah. in your prenatals, in your, you know, your uh, athletes. Athletes already uh, have a black market of trading breast milk, right? I was going to say, I can see that market being a, a very strong one just because I feel like if you tell an athlete that they're going to get a performance boost from something, they are, uh, for better or for worse, more willing to try it than <laughs> yeah. the average subset of the population. Yeah, when you it comes can buy down ketones, to it. you can buy a lot of stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, and you can start doping and somehow, you know, make it to the Olympics, right, you know? Right. So just to go back to the conference, is this one track of the conference? Yeah, so okay. we do um, so we do cell based and plant based innovation together. Okay. Um, we thread them together because we think that they're both the future of food. So we talk about we have Brave Robot, which is a precision fermentation company. We also have one that I'm really excited about, Melly Bio. It's the world's first you know lab grown honey. So it's bio identical honey. It's everything that honey is, but it's made without the process of the bee doing it, which is pretty wild. Quick tangent: Is honey vegan or no? Because I wouldn't consider bees to be harmed in the production of honey, but maybe I'm misinformed. So local apiaries, you know, typically it's a pretty, you know, kind process. Commercialized honey, the stuff, the crap that you're getting at the store is not. So that's kind of the short of it. So, you know, there's some people that'll have local honey themselves. And I don't think it's, it's like the same as free range eggs. Like, I think that's neither here nor there. It's not really the point. That's not how 99.9% of food is made. Yeah. 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 That's always the challenge. Though. Once you go big scale, it's hard. You, you, yeah. you cut corners. Yep. You speed up fermentation. You start doing additives. All yeah. that stuff. Biomilk and Turtle tr- Turtle Labs. Turtle, turtle Trees. Tree Labs. Yeah, Biomilk. There's um, Helena as well as kind of a third one. But like I just named three companies right. when it's just almost 7 billion people, you know, 8 billion people out there. And, you know, I tell people all the time, I say the fact that we didn't have alternatives to infant formula until a couple of years ago is a really good sign of gender bias and in investing because 100 percent of us were babies. Can you say that again? That's such a great point for people listening. That is such a great point. It's, it's showing you the lack of the lack of attention paid to, you know, pregnancy infant toddler space is a very clear indication of gender bias and in investing. That's unbelievable. Is that changing though? Because like you said, like she's on a mission. Right, right, right. But like, are, are, are you seeing that change right now? <laughs> I in, mean, in any meaningful so way. So here's the thing. Women were slowly inching up year after year, getting more and more venture capital until the pandemic. And they took a turn back down. Right. So women are now, it's like 2.7% of all venture capital last year went towards women founders. And that was a decrease from the year before we were closer to, I think we were like 3.3 on the highest a few years ago. So it's not great. It is unfortunate that the pandemic, basically they made, you know, investors bearish and they got scared and, and they ended up just making safe bets. And if you are one of the 95% of male VCs, predominantly white male VCs, the markets, you know, the best are 
probably crypto and apps and things like that. And so if somebody shows up with you, it's like, I got this breast milk thing. You're probably like, uh, okay, we're going to pass, you know? And that's, that's the reality of it is when you have a homogenous group that's controlling the majority of the capital, then you have homogenous products that are created and there's entire underserved markets that just get left out of the conversation. Are there a bunch of VCs going to your events also? Yeah. 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 So okay. we, in addition to, so the Vegan Women's Summit is our big in-person conference. We also do Pathfinder uh, every fall and that's our pitch competition. Um, so we do that virtually and we'll actually keep that virtually forever because we get access to women founders literally all over. It's so cool. So we've had over a thousand women founders apply from 31 countries since we launched it a year and a half ago. And are you incubator? We are not. We have thought about, yeah, we've kind of, we've, we've toyed around with like where we kind of want to go with the community because we have a great pitch competition. The majority of our finalists certainly get investment um, because we have so many VCs that we work with. Um, we give out a prize package. We're actually going to be showcasing our winner, Sunfed Meets. She's going to actually be at the event at Vegan Women's Summit. So we're really kind of taking our winners and being able to put them on our stage. So that's really exciting. We looked at doing an accelerator. We thought about doing an incubator. And even like a mentorship program. But that is contrasted with the other idea of what I want to do because we're a four person team so far. We're growing, but I, I'm really interested in the other side as well, empowering our community to become investors. I'll say quick tangent and then we'll go back to this. Everybody that I have had on the, on the podcast at CPG, they all ask me for one thing and it's always the same because I'm a developer. They go build me a facility where I can, one, it's got a little daycare center because it's important to have structure and the kids need to see us working and our house doesn't work. And then two, I can do all the whatever else I'm making so I can make cookie dough or whatever the thing is. And so it's like CPG meets daycare center meets a little little area for of offices for working. And this is like, ideally we want to do this in Nashville and LA, just create like a community where that's kind of scales with them also, where we can do like additional warehouses and stuff. Have you ever thought about doing something like that where it's like, you have maybe an incubator, maybe you have a funding arm, maybe you have a little, right, your own little VC. So like a founder house? A founder house, something that helps people get the first step and then also like their initial investment. Yeah, we've we've thought about that. We actually, you know, we put together the pieces to do an accelerator last year and kind of, you know, built out what it would look like, talked to some funders on it. And we ultimately decided that it wasn't the right fit for us at the time. And I think that for us... I think we have a lot of VCs that want to fund the founders that we're getting. Really what we're creating is that access point and that like media arm for the VCs that they didn't really have. So we're kind of the magnet for that right now. And we've been able to kind of successfully turn them over to folks that can take them to the next level. But the piece that we haven't been able to tackle that I'm really kind of toying around with right now is how I take of those 40,000 women professionals, there's a lot of them that have a little bit of extra money lying around. And I really think that we have a tremendous opportunity to turn these women into investors. And, you know, maybe it's an angel syndicate to start. Maybe, like you know. Kismet. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's like an impact fund like that. That's a big piece because women don't invest. They estimate that women leave about a million dollars on the table throughout their professional career. Why, why is that? Is it access? There's a huge education gap and women don't invest. Like, and so when I say a million dollars, I say like this is relating to literally having like a portfolio of stocks, like everything. Women, just generally speaking, are much less likely to be investors than their male counterparts in every regard. And I think that is because culturally speaking, when you think of like Wolf of Wall Street, it's a bunch of dudes like it's historically investing has been a man's space. And, you know, I was having this conversation over brunch at the International Women's um, Day event I was with with a few other founders and they just said like, I see guys and guys talk about their investments to other guys and they all have this like ecosystem and network where they're telling each other what to invest in. But women just like don't have that most of the time, unfortunately. I mean, crypto is a really sad space too. Like 81% of crypto holders are men. Yeah. Like women in crypto is so, so few and it's yeah. getting, it's getting more stratified too. It's getting like worse mm -hmm. as well. We just had the nudie community. It's an all female led NFT project. Mm -hmm. And so they run our podcast. And that's the one thing they say, it's like 12% of everyone in the NFT space or 12% of the total is only female right now. And that's just not enough. And so they they keep trying to bring the awareness and women in NFTs. And it's so fascinating Yeah. Uh, because in that setting, right, to your point, it's almost one, you have to know tech. And so now it's like, let's play, let's play gender on that game. Mm -hmm. And it's like mostly men and then, okay. And then do you know anything about crypto or NFTs? The gender game wins again. And then it's like, cool, now let's launch a project. <laughs> so it's like you're like three steps removed from basically the male domination on that side of it. That's so fascinating. Yeah. And 
Okay. Here, I'll add another layer to it. Let's say you're not sitting in Los Angeles or San Francisco or New York. Right. Let's say you're sitting in Kansas City or Baltimore or Atlanta. You might as well be in Manila or Mumbai at that point. We need more women at every level of this. And the piece we didn't even talk about, we also run job networking series. We have the only food tech job networking series in the world. We connected over 2,000 job seekers with like Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat and Miyoko's and all the top employers last year because that's the other piece to it is we don't have women in representation in you know the talent pipeline either. And that's everywhere from junior roles all the way up to the executive roles. Uh, you can take a look at the executive C-suites of the largest food tech companies and you'll see not a lot of women. There's some, you know, some of the biggest plant-based companies in the world have like one or two C-suite officers, which is insane. And that's a big thing we have to tackle as well. What keeps you up at night? Is it this product, this problem? How to attack it? Yeah. I mean, that's certainly a big piece of it. Trying to figure out honestly, like how we can get a mass like proliferation of plant-based products and future food products that will be big enough for us to get consumer adoption that stops us from warming 1.5 degrees, right? You know, I think most of us in the space and I think into the larger ESG space, we all have that 10-year mark in our head. I think we're all thinking of the 10-year countdown and that's what I think about most often. What do you think happens in five years? Do you think people are still drinking nut milk or is it this, the milk you mentioned? If you ask some of the people with the tech, they'll say five years from now they're going to be to market. Uh, I don't know if the commercialization will happen that quickly because of the regulatory fights. So one of the things that's interesting, we talked about Brave Robot earlier, which is Perfect Days technology. Because it's not actually novel ingredients, it went to market right away, faster than like the cell-based meats. So I think that we'll actually see that precision fermentation technology replicate and be much, much, much more prevalent in these next coming years. You'll see at Expo West this week, there's a ton of people that are going to be putting in Perfect Day technology into their products rolling out this year. So to answer your question, I think we'll see a lot more animal-free innovation in the next five years, but it won't necessarily be in the categories that we had once predicted it would be in. To think about like, what does a coffee shop look like? Where are the beans coming from? Yeah, I mean, you can use... Where are the milks coming from? Yeah, the cell, you can use the cell-based technology for the milks. You can use it for the, you know, coffee's a very, very resource-intensive. And, and totally. when you get into the carbon footprint of coffee, it's not great. You know, almonds aren't great. There's a lot of, a lot of like, things like that that, that are not um, very great for the environment. And they're not technically animal products either. Yeah. And all these technologies can, can apply to them. Has COVID ad- accelerated anything specifically when it comes to the plant-based vegan space? So, I mean, last year was a record year for all protein. It was like over 3 billion was invested. So it it definitely skyrocketed. And that was largely because we had food insecurity issues. We had entire countries that had like massive supply chain disruption that happened because of COVID. Singapore is a great example. They import 95% of their food. Oh, wow. 95. So they decided as a result of COVID that they would put in the 30 by 30, which is 30% of their food has to be produced um, in Singapore by 2030. And Singapore is a city nation, right? It's an island. There's They don't have space to farm. Yeah. What do you think they're putting all their money in? Lab grown? Yeah. Warehousing. The warehousing of food, the lab. Vertical yeah. farming, Vertical farming um, cell-based. Yeah. I mean, it's all the protein, plant-based protein, cell-based protein. That's why Singapore is the first country in the world that regulated cell-based protein to be consumed by uh, the public. And they're using crypto to buy it. <laughs> well, <laughs> not, yeah, not we'll see. No, I mean, kidding. everybody's using crypto this last like week and a half after all those bank runs, man. That's a real problem. We had three different nations that lost access to their bank accounts in the last month uh, in totally different parts of the world for different insane. reasons. Mm-hmm. It's insane. It's what the crypto people have been telling you this whole time is going to happen. Yeah. Are you not into crypto? Are you into crypto? I'm hard into Bitcoin. You know? Hard I into think, Bitcoin? Smart. Yeah. Okay. Good for you. I think that Bitcoin and crypto are two different things, right? And I also think that where they're going to take like the metaverse from like a capitalist perspective is very interesting. I honestly think that you're going to see... Bitcoin become like a long-term asset. It already is, you know, it's already like property. It's yeah, exactly. And you're going to be able to like leverage your loans and all of that to get money off of it when you need it. Obviously governments are starting to accept it. Lugano, Switzerland. Did you hear? Switzerland has now officially started accepting Bitcoin as legal tender. You can pay your taxes in it. It's only one city so far, but it's Switzerland. I mean, it's the banking capital of the world. So that's huge. So I think you're going to see people hold Bitcoin in the future. You know, I think there's going to be a move to like digital coins from like the U.S. government. They're going to try to do like that U.S. You know, the thing they say they're going to roll. USD. Yeah. Well, and then Tether's trying to do their version, but I think the U.S. government's going to roll out their version. But then aside from that, 
you're going to just like see membership like communities based on like entire like coins like walmart's already going in on it walmart's gonna start saying like okay get your like wall coins and then before you know it their employees can't legally be paid in wall coins but they'll be like okay here's your pay but like if you change your pay in you get 20 percent more in wall coins that's where i see it going it's kind of like what the mining companies used to do like 150 years ago they used to pay and like the, right. you, you know, you've ever heard of that concept? You, you go to the town store owned yeah. by the company and you pay the town store in money that, that only yes. the company gives. And yeah. Doesn't that feel like a it's, metaverse a little bit? It sounds like a, a little, little bit, bit dystopian, to be yeah. honest. So the capitalist perspective of the metaverse, I'm not excited about. I, I don't think that's that's too great. But I do think that Bitcoin is, is here to stay. I mean, yeah, I agree. Will you talk about this at the conference too? Is this, I don't know, a session? Uh, so we do do the future of women in investing kind of, and that, um, you touch on this. Okay. Yeah. So we'll probably dive into like the different ways that women can be making money and things like that. So angel investing, we'll probably get into a little bit of crypto. I don't want to start like pushing like sure. crypto trading on people because you know, that that's, that shit's crazy. Trading you know? in general. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, it's like day trading. Like you got to know what you're doing. And I get these women all the time that reach out or well, people in general. Some of my family is like, Hey, I heard this like coin's going to be great. What do you think? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, what are you talking about? Like, can you just buy Bitcoin like I told you to five years ago? Like, can you please keep it simple and stop like listening to Facebook for your news? Are you into any NFTs or what do you view the future as NFTs from your world lens? Okay. So I am not an NFT expert. So I have a lot of friends that are musicians, like very well. It's like, you know, I've got one of my friends is in the Misfits. Like, I mean, like very well established nice. musicians. Yeah. And they make like shit a month. Like they make nothing a month off of Spotify because of the radical changes that have happened in yeah. the Fractions industry. of like pennies. pennies. Yeah, it's just like, 003. Right. It's oh, like it's, 0.03 cents per thousand yeah. uh, it's listens. It's insulting. Streams. It's bad, yeah. Yeah, my, um, if you guys remember Groove Shark back in the day, when yeah. I, my, my husband's best friend <laughs> yeah. founded that company actually. <laughs> nice. So we were, we were Groove Shark <laughs> early fam. So I am all, I'm anti-Spotify, uh, if callback. you can't tell, but... Um, a lot of the musicians that I speak to, like they rely on like Patreon and crap like that. Like the creator economy is the only way that they're making money, which is so unfortunate because you, and then in the last few years, they haven't been able to tour. And so like, even though these are musicians, or you would YouTube like, or something. Yeah, yeah. you would like notice on the street, like really well accomplished people. That's the world they're living in. And so in my opinion, like NFTs there make a lot of sense. Have you heard of Sing? The, it's like a new artist platform. So our Lady Peace, which is a yeah. I, I, okay, you guys know I'm OLP. Yeah, yeah, right. great band. Okay, well, I didn't Superman's know if they made dead? it. Dude, I didn't know if they made it over the border. Okay, I'm from Canada, and whenever I say, when I say funny. OLP to some folks, they're That's like, funny. they're like, what is that? So, like the lead singer Rain, he started an NFT like platform called Sing, and it's like becoming a real company. And they just released Our Lady Peace's like latest album as an NFT. And I feel like there's a really great future for places where you already have a built-in membership base. Like, music makes a lot of sense, in my opinion. Will all the digital art stay? Like, eh, that's Yeah, the, the digital art is more of like a, just your, your membership card, essentially. Yeah. And everyone has their own unique one. I wonder if you could tokenize a conference. Because there's two things that work against you. One, you obviously want way more people. And so you, can't, you don't want to limit the people. But if you tokenize it, you could do like super fun events. And then you have like a, a built-in budget, essentially. And then... You could also just start a membership fee right on your website and email it to same people. concept like, yeah, like yeah the thing it's is, easier you know i guess in a lot of ways like nfts also kind of just replicate the value that you can get from pre-existing systems in some ways you know you can make a membership a fan club already right but again i think that for music in particular especially where a lot of artists like rain was sharing that his wife wrote the theme song for la la land you know which won the oscar and somebody like hacked her computer and stole the song. So that was actually how he got inspired because he wanted to start figuring out a way to like safely store their recordings. So that's where the whole thing came from, which I thought was very interesting. They stole it before the movie premiered? Yeah, it was like there's like some yeah, some like really bad hacking story there. I don't know all the details. And then it, you know, went into went on to be like a huge freaking movie right. too. Yeah, so there's some whole story. Please like look up the story if you're interested because I don't know all the details, but that was part of the impetus for getting into NFTs was the security and like safety aspect of how the blockchain could protect the recordings. And then the distribution piece is where, you know, I think it's gone now. I know they're going to start to do it with like sneakers too. Yeah. So they'll blockchain sneakers. Which makes a lot more sense. So in Pokemon music cards. vein, I also heard that Kygo and Ryan Tedder of One Republic are releasing music under mm -hmm. the Bored Ape 
banner because they both are, are buyers in the Board Ape Yacht Club. And so they're doing Board Ape music, I believe. And they're not the only ones that I've heard about doing NFT music releases. Like a lot of uh, other rappers are, are doing it as well. That's it's, smart. Yeah. Nas will do it. What else uh, should we talk about in regards to your conference? What I'm really excited about is, I mean, first off, we've got 600 plus people flying in from all over the world. We're actually debuting a number of brands that have never been in the U.S. in North America before. So we have like mycelium bacon. Um, so that's basically... Mycelium bacon? Yeah, that's like super like mushroom future bacon. Really cool stuff coming from Spain. We've got the, the salad-based honey that I was talking about. Um, we've got brands coming from Singapore, Hong Kong. So we're really trying to be kind of like, in a way, like a mini CES for, for the future of food. We also have some fashion and beauty brands. So I'm excited about that. You know, I probably about 40% of the folks that are coming are not in the vegan space and aren't vegan themselves. More and more every single day, we have people who are just interested in the space that are coming into it. And that's my goal. My goal is to empower the nearly 4 billion women in this world to help make um, the world a kinder, more sustainable place in whatever way possible. Put your money in it, buy shit, start a company. I don't really care, but I just want to show you that there's a, a path for you to come into the industry. I'm excited to go yeah. and check yeah. it out. It's going to be, be fun. It's going to be really fun. And then, of course, you know, you get the celebrities come out and it just like ties together that I guess for me, and this is part of my book too, we just need more representation, right? About 70% of our speakers are women of color in particular. There's just not enough representation. There's not enough representation of women as CEOs. There's not enough representation as investors, as Olympians, like whatever you name it. We just need to showcase that women can kick ass in their space in regardless, you know, regardless of where they come from, of, of who they are. And that's part of the stories in my book, The Future of Food is Female. I spoke to 15 women around the world, CEOs, celebrities, investors, got a member of the European Parliament in there. And it was really focused upon, I want every single person that picks up this book to connect to like one of these, these stories. I want there to be that tale in there that resonates with you, no matter who you are, um, so that you can see that you can become a leader in this space that's too. That's really smart. Yeah. There's a magazine behind you. I'm, the whole magazine, I did a story. <laughs> and the whole point of it is when I moved to this country, you look around and there is no Peruvian. Like you couldn't find one in the MBA or like my doctor wasn't or a doctor I didn't know or an engineer or a lawyer or a famous person. And so for me, it became very personal that they don't exist. And so I have to be that person for my family. And I took that very personally. And so that's kind of led everything I've done. And what you're doing is amazing because you're sharing different versions of that story. So hopefully anyone who opens that book will connect with that. Yeah. So kudos. That's amazing. Totally. And that's uh, so important. It really is. The representation of it and seeing anyone, seeing someone like that looks like you has achieved whatever it is. That connection is everything. It's so important. And, you know, you get a lot of flack people like, oh, it's like tokenism. Representation doesn't no, really matter. But it matters. It does. It yeah. really, really does. I was fortunate. I had a stay-at-home dad, so I was raised in, like, Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. I was raised, like, <laughs> girls are, like, you know, everything that boys are, I'm pretty sure, is what he taught me. And just, like, I didn't realize as I got older, unpacking what that meant for me and, and my personality and then comparing it to the other women that I grew up with and how it has now manifested now that they're older. I just, I feel like I have so much more in my toolkit than they do and that largely is because they they weren't really given that representation that i think i was from an early age yeah that's super important too even something as simple as like a parent just telling their kids they can do anything i mean that's just the confidence alone is really important and somehow not enough yeah it doesn't happen enough where can people get your book uh, okay, so my book's coming out on April 5th. The Future of Food is Female. It'll be on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the regular bookstores. You'll be doing a signing? I will be, yes. We're going to announce like a book tour. So we're going to be going across the U.S. Then we'll hop up to Canada. So we're going to be doing really cool women founder events in all different ecosystems. Because the book's not just about me. The book is about, you know, all these women. So we're actually going to be having guest speakers at all the different um, spots all around the U.S. So That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We'll do Boulder, Austin, uh, Miami Beach, Atlanta, Raleigh, I think then we'll head up Philly, DC, New York. And then I've got a big one we're planning in Toronto, um, which is where I'm from, that I'm excited about because I've not been back to Canada um, since before the pandemic. Toronto is like totally great to visit. I would not want to be living there. Also, they had the longest lockdown. So yes. <laughs> shit's a bit rough over there. They frustrated a lot of people by going in and out and in and out. Yes. Yeah. The in and out was the real problem. It was yeah. like seven months long at one point. Right. So yeah, I'm excited to just like, it's a new day. Let's get people together and get them together in person. Yeah, 100%. 
tell everyone where they can obviously support the conference. Yeah. Okay. So you can go to veganwomensummit.com if you want to follow all the different updates we have, veganwomensummit.com slash newsletter. If you are an investor that's listening, I have a really cool thing that you might be interested in. So we do Women Founder Wednesday. Women Founder Wednesday is the only newsletter that brings together um, the future of food, fashion, beauty, and biotechnology. I curate 12 to 16 um, stories every single week of things that women founders are doing around the world in this space, or rather my team does. And what's cool about that is if you want to keep your eye on how you can be investing in more women and women of color, I will get it into your inbox every single Wednesday. Also, if you have women in your portfolio that are in the plant-based space or the future of food, fashion, beauty space, send them my way and we will plug them out to tens of thousands of people in the VWS community. So yeah, that's really cool. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, at Vegan Women Summit, Twitter, at Veg Women Summit. We're pretty much everywhere. And then if folks are interested in, in what I work on, I actually have LinkedIn's top future of food creator account. Um, so oh, you can, that's a thing. That's I have a, a LinkedIn fact. manager. Wow. Yeah. LinkedIn reached out and everything. They were like, what, what do you have to do? You have to create a, a piece of content a day or what's the. No, ask? not it. So here's OK. Here's like your fun little bonus tip for the podcast, okay? If you're really interested, LinkedIn is a great platform to leverage. Like it seriously is the underdog right now. Everybody was all into Instagram. Now we're all into TikTok, but really LinkedIn is where it's at. There's a few reasons why. First off, the algorithm is in your favor. It's not in the pay to play space that all the like, you know, meta owned companies are right now. Um, So you can still get really good impressions. Like I can get over a million impressions on some of my posts just organically, which is like unheard of in other social media platforms, right? So that's, you know, one tip why you should be on LinkedIn. The other thing I'll say is if you really want to get like good algorithm coverage on LinkedIn, you actually want to post like max three times a week. So you don't want to post every single day. It's not like other platforms. Some platforms reward you the more that you post. LinkedIn, in fact, is like every two or three days is better. Duly noted. Solid tip. Yeah. Tell our team. This is like a legit tip for you guys. And the reason is- I never post on LinkedIn, maybe once a week. I never go on LinkedIn. (laughs) Our our podcast account, I think they do daily. Yeah. I think they're at daily, right? Maybe maybe we should scale back. Sounds like three times the magic number. Yeah. Well, LinkedIn is, yeah, I mean, it's a little different for a company page, right? A company page and a personal right. page, I think, are a little different. But the thing that's interesting about LinkedIn is it's a highly curated audience and it's like a very highly professional audience with a lot of decision makers and things like that. So for the work that we do, like that's how we find so many founders, but it's also why we find so many investors. That's why we find so many women that are applying for jobs. Like, you know, they're like, we need PhD scientists. I'm like, oh, 10% of our community has a PhD. Here you go. Like it's like ridiculous, but that's the access that you get on a platform like that. And you're not going to get that on Instagram. Like Instagram's like consumer audience. Yeah, that is, like yeah. if you're selling stuff, like sure, but that's not where you're going to make meaningful connections. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jenny. Thank yeah. you so much for coming on the Thanks show. Thanks for coming on. We'll Thanks see you at the conference. Me. Yeah, <laughs> see you there. Thanks for talking all things future of food. We hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Jenny, founder of Vegan Women's Summit. And since you've stuck around for the credits, please consider subscribing. Or, if you haven't already, leave us a review on Apple or Spotify. It's one of the best and easiest ways you can support us in the show. We are at Startup Storefront on every social media platform except for Twitter, where you can find us at STS Podcast LA. The team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capolini, Lexi Jameson, Owen Capolini, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is by Double Touch. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time.